Hey, hey, what's up? This is Silas. And I'm Stephen Kirshner. We're back for part five of the series on You Are What You Consume. It's part six. Part six. Yeah, okay. It's part <laughs> six. <laughs> but yeah, that's why he's here. He's here for... It's, it's, a, it's a group kind of effort here. So yeah, yeah it's this, a conversation we have. This is the sixth one we've had on this topic. And um, the last one was, what, industrial consumption? Industrial consumption, yes. We talked a bit about... It was a number of things. We talked about some of the darker aspects of the industry. We talked about automation. We talked about how immigration, especially illegal immigration, has affected the industry and what the future could be out of that. Uh, just sort of how people's choice of food has to do with their choice of lifestyle as well and how all that all ties together. Yeah, so that's the food industry you're talking about where... Um the initial start of this, for some of you who are listening to this video for the first one, not coming from the previous ones, right. which shame on you, you should watch in order. But <laughs> but those ones, uh, the initial start of this started just talking about that saying, you are what you eat. And then I took it further and kind of thought you are what you, I mean, you are what you consume, where humans were not necessarily just the physical food that we eat, but where also the ideas that we take in and pretty much everything is consumption. Like you guys listening to this video is a form of consumption mm -hmm. and you're going to get something out of it, just how we appropriate nutrients from food and we get that in and then that builds up our bodies. We get ideas. I was going to say, I mean, even just watching TV shows, I mean, how that affects your thinking. If it, if they talk about certain trends and how much it ties to pop culture, how much people are influenced by that, how yeah. much that, changes the culture how much that affects trends in the marketplace all that and then also the fact that most of these other things that we do have in our life where we might think is not necessarily consumption i think we're afforded the ability to do a lot of these because we've dealt with just the direct physical consumption if you are truly starving truly hungry don't have food you don't have time for anything else really in your life besides handling that part of it right so with this part, uh, I think we're going to be talking about, there's a few different topics, but we're going to break, we're going to start building off on um, the idea that we had touching on the industrialization. Of yes. The uh, automation. Uh, automation of the food industry. And one thing I'd like to kind of start bringing in is also how it actually changes the food that's being eaten. So not necessarily just the industrialization of if I'm having an actual machine making my food, if I don't know how to make the pasta myself, but how does it turn from, let's say there's a Japanese person making your pasta in some kind of sushi, China, like Japanese style, like they have these things, what are they? Sushi ritos, where it's like a sushi, but it's like a burrito. So like, when does that become fusion? When does something become a new dish? And uh, yeah. Well, I think, um... I remember I had this French chef in school, he said how oh, people call it fusion, it's more like confusion sometimes. And I think I think the French tend to be more kind of purist in their cooking, but then again, even that doesn't hold up either because you think about, like we made the example in an earlier video about how they say they invented chowder, but come on, it's like there's no way that other people <laughs> living by the sea didn't figure that out. Uh, and then of course, now you might see on a French menu, you might see tropical fruit, but it's like obviously France is in a tropical country. They brought that, those things in later when they colonized other countries or bought them. Uh, so again, it's like how much is really pure technically. I mean, you might take some of the techniques, but you could apply them to other things as well. Yeah. Like for example, there's a famous uh, French dish, the tarte tatin, which is basically like, a, it's kind of like an upside down pie. Like basically what it is, is the fruit is flipped over and it's caramelized in the pan so because of that it gets like a nice golden brown cover but then you put the crust on top you bake it like that and then you pull it out and when you serve it you flip it over so you have a golden crust but caramelized fruit on top mm -hmm. and that was like original a pineapple turnover or something like that well is what i was going to say is it was originally done probably i think it was either apple or peach or something but mm -hmm. then now you could do it with other things you could do it with tropical fruit or something but again it's like that fruit's not native to france but that technique there was a story about there were the Tatin sisters who I guess were fooling around and I guess they let they let the fruit sit because typically like when you make apple pie or something you simmer the fruit and then you put it into the crust put the other crust on and bake it mm -hmm. but with this they let it go too long so they I guess they just put the crust on top of that and put that in the oven so that crust was baked so you had the golden crust and then when you flipped it over you had caramelized fruit on the other side but it was open with no crust on top 
So it was kind of an accident, but yeah. but it became a new dish, and then popular. And of course, people have tweaked it, done their own thing. And that's another thing. That's, <laughs> a, that's one of the things we're trying to also discuss in this: is when is something cuisine, and when is it cooking? And it also ties in with this other series I'm doing on art, where I was asking, can art be made by accident? Now, this is a kind of situation where I'm, there's probably a lot of foods out there that were made by accident. Somebody left something out, like. Uh, well, that about alcohol, potato, like the potato chip, alcohol, uh, potato chip. Okay, you could talk about that. You, one. You basically, potatoes typically they were cooked more like fries, but they cut them too thin. They dropped them and they came out crispy. And the, I guess who I forget where it was, but whoever did it, they thought, oh, I made a mistake. But they're like, oh, this is a nice crunch, and then that just became a dish from there. How do the kettle things? Because I remember when kettle chips first started coming out. I think it was the first kettle chips I saw was over a decade ago. I think it was Oots, U T Z, like that company had. Oh them, yeah, yeah, and they were really. They didn't really taste that good and the way it was and I think it took a while for people to get on that. Now there's companies that just do kettle chips. So it's it's strange with talking about how these things kind of come up. So, um, well, like I was going to say with fries, a lot of people, the way you make those, for those that don't know, is that you have to do something called blanching, where what you do is yes, you yeah, cook very key. You cook ingredients. them at uh, 300 degrees or so Fahrenheit, and then that's that basically causes some of the starch to seep out. Then you cook them again at 350 or so, mm-hmm. and then that's how they get crispy. But that initial process, the, you have these potatoes, and then when you cook them at that lower temperature they come out they're kind of wiggly yeah. and then when you fry them again they get crispy yeah so that's how you get them cooked inside and crispy on the outside otherwise you're gonna get soggy fries exactly but with the potato chips i think it was just they were just cut too thin somehow and they were thrown in because originally i think the fries were cut more like that like the rounder just the shape of the potato but then they figured out oh well they just get crispy on their own because there's so little starch anyway the starch just bleeds out when you're cooking so you know, you're left with this nice crispy item and you see, and that's the thing I think that's good to consider when you're thinking about with foods. If somebody's like, I feel like getting potatoes in me today, or I feel like getting a carb-dense yeah. thing. Now, there's many different options you have for carb-dense food. Now, there's potato chips. If you want the potato itself, the taste of the potato, if you want a fried potato, you go to that point. Now, there's french fries, and then there's uh, the um, Potato chips is also what the hollandaise. They're not hollandaise. You know the one where they. What's the name of that one? I you keep say hollandaise. Is I, sauce. I keep forgetting the name of this actual dish. It's that dish, the French dish, where they kind of cut potatoes in little discs, like thicker potato chips, and then they fry it up with onions and like spring onions. I know. I, I you know. Do you I, know think, I know what you're talking about. Leonese potatoes. Leonese potatoes. Yes, yeah, that. Leonese, I keep yeah. forgetting the name of that. Okay, so there's all those different kinds of those those different levels of uh, frying a potato. Uh, Just the same I, was gonna, way. I was gonna say sorry to interrupt. I remember I was going through the French Laundry cookbook again, where we talked about it in an earlier discussion. Mm-hmm. And Thomas Keller said when he was learning cooking, at one point he was able to make something like fifteen potato preparations from memory. Cool. So you think about it. There's like, you know, there's like you say the Lyonnaise, there's pump puree, the mashed potatoes, there's the gratin with the crust. Yeah. Uh, there's there's one I had where I did my externship in Boston. It was really nice where they cut the potatoes thin and then. They laid them in a circle within a ring mold, and they brown the bottom on the pan, sort of like the tartar town is describing. And they flip it over and bake it in the oven. Yeah. So the tar, the but the layers have uh, butter, thyme, and salt in between them, and then the top is a nice crispy layer, and you just slice into it and eat it. Really good. Cool. Yeah. You see, like that's now a whole different way. And yeah. this is one thing I was kind of thinking about with the information and this consumption thing. They're all potatoes. You're all ingesting potatoes. It's essentially the same material, mm-hmm. the same nu- nutrition in a way. But the prep of it is different. The way it's presented is different. The way you go about it is different. If somebody requests a potato, but they have in mind to get Lyonnaise potatoes, or what was that thing you just (laughs) called? I forget what it was called. It was another French name. uh, Or if they wanted something like that, something very unique, and there's a certain presentation in a certain location in a certain place for that. And I think one of the problems we're having in society right now is people are preparing French fries like they would that dish, or maybe they're they're frying potato chips, they're cutting potato chips into that size and trying to fry them up with onions and spring onions, like they're making Lyonnaise potatoes and ruining the actual product. Or people are eating something, ordering something, going to like a news source and saying like, look, I'm expecting Lyonnaise potatoes from Twitter. When Twitter is just potato chips. Yeah, <laughs> you know? exactly. so it's that's like, a good analogy. It's yeah. like, don't yeah. actually go on Twitter and expect to get anything but potato chips. You're not going to get full, actual, in-depth coverage about things on that. Doesn't mean Twitter or other forms of social media or other forms of, of getting information are negative, but there's a time and place for different things, and I think people need to be more 
more aware of what they're getting, how they're getting it. And also personally for me, it's definitely something I'm concerned with how I'm presenting certain information to people. Yeah, I mean, you could have a good meal at a diner or something, but it's like you go in there expecting a burger, maybe breakfast meal at night or something like that. You're not expecting like the French laundry experience we posted. So now that fusion and confusion thing. So now that's the fusion. We're fusing these old ways of doing things, these dishes or the ideas we have in mind, the needs we have in mind, and then there's some confusion in how to get those ideas now. So when it comes to foods, do you have an example at all of any food where you think like, okay, this is a point where it's actually gone so far from what it Your sushi was. burrito you mentioned yeah. earlier, that's one thing, where it's like, okay, I get you're trying to be creative. I saw there was a weird fusion restaurant, I think I saw it was like a Japanese-Mexican restaurant, like the fusion with that, like, it's just when you think about the ingredients that are used, the spices, the techniques, just how different they are, it's really hard to come together and make something coherent. Like, that's where it does become kind of like, okay, you're trying to be different, I get that, but at the same <laughs> but at the same time it's like it kinda doesn't make sense. Yeah. It, it's like it's like like you and I were discussing earlier about like people who try to be provocative just to be provocative. It's like, yeah, you're getting attention because of it, but it's like, is that really a good thing or are you offering people something that's worthwhile? I mean, maybe, you know, maybe it could be. I haven't been in that place, in fairness, but it's just, I think of the spices, I think of the ingredients, I just think of the techniques and all that and just how much they vary, and it's like, yeah. can that really be a good product? Like, it's kind of far-fetched to me. And I think that's where, yeah, that's where the experts come in, because there are some things where somebody will be able to sell you something because they know the spice combination. They could take even a low-quality product, but because they know how taste buds work together... I'm sure there's gastronomy, there's a science to these yeah. things that I'm not too necessarily aware for. I like just experimenting, yeah. and I'm sure you do too, and yeah. you try different things. Sure. But there's definitely people who would be able to sell you. They could. There's people who could go to McDonald's. I think we discussed this in a video before the presentation. It might have been the first video. Where some company went to McDonald's, and then they had these gourmet chefs or students kind of arrange the food in a way where it looked like a gourmet meal but it was still the same exact ingredients so i think you've got to be careful sometimes some people have certain budgets and expertise to sell you some really low quality information in like yeah. a really appealing package that might taste good like one thing I, this is just a side thing yeah, yeah, sure. for a while is i have a big suspicion whenever i watch a video on youtube or somewhere where there's like music playing in the back that's not just in the scene but it's like some tune like dun, 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 just some some low ground music in the back not like soundtracks it also reminds me more of soundtracks why are films and real life so off because the soundtrack's kind of setting the mood but when they have those little jingle type things in the back i'm always very suspicious i don't know about you guys but <laughs> well you know it's interesting my uh, my parents were telling me they went to a concert a while ago where john williams the classical composer in modern times he was he was there and it was really cool because they showed different scenes from his movies, Indiana Jones, Star Wars movies and so on. And he talked about come, having music that matches the scenes and so on. Mm -hmm. And it was cool. And you see just the scene playing with no sound and you hear it with the music. You're like, wow, this really matches. But it was cool just how he was able to synchronize that, look at the movie and say, okay, how can I come up with something that matches this? Yeah. Like, you know, for those Star Wars nerds out there, there's like the Imperial March. You think of like, you know, the Star Destroyers moving, Vader standing there and all that. But then, of course, you have the you know you have the opening crawl. It's with the trumpets and all. Yeah, and it, it, yeah, exactly. And that, but that's what it is. It's all it's all sort of like that. And uh, I've heard I've seen other things. For example, speeches. Somebody will give a speech. They'll play this triumphant music in the background, yeah. and you feel motivated by that. Uh, it's interesting. There's actually I don't know if you'd call them a group, but uh, they're called Two Steps from Hell, and they do a lot of uh, music for trailers and so on. And it's interesting because I've listened to a lot of this stuff on my own, and now when I watch History Channel stuff or certain movies, I actually hear the music in the background. But it's really cool. Like for example, there's one they have a song called "The Strength of a Thousand Men," mm -hmm. and like it shows a, a train running. So things like that, like it's kind of cool. But exactly. you, yeah, it's you hear that though, it's like you know, it, it's just very like you know, invigorating, and you feel motivated. Yeah, and they have. Yeah, what, what what kind of music would they play at uh, at a Japanese fusion well, we, we, Mexican fusion place? Would it be like? Well, you know, it's fun. It's funny because I think what, music playing. I don't know. Yeah, I mentioned this earlier. I think in another video, but where I work at Neta, we actually play like uncensored '90s hip hop, and it's funny because it's received different ways. Other people are like, "Oh, why is this playing here?" Other people are like, "Wow, you have a great <laughs> soundtrack." Yeah. And where I used to work too, Eddie and the Wolf. I, I go to eat there. That's an Austrian restaurant in the uh, East Village. For those that don't know. Um, I remember one summer there, all we played was Cuban salsa and uh, 
like reggae, basically Jamaican reggae. It was funny. I remember there was a funny story. My uh, one of my friends, she's British. She was working there, and this Hungarian family comes in, and they say to her, "Only in New York City can a Hungarian family come into an Austrian restaurant, be waited on by a British girl, and listen to Spanish music." <laughs> I thought that was kind of yeah. cool. <laughs> yeah. No, it's it's an it's an odd situation how you see these these things working together. Like, what's the connection? Does it fuse things together in your mind? Because I think there is a connection with the the taste of the foods that you have, the ideas where you are in your life at that time. Then, does it confuse something by having a certain experience or certain food or a certain certain taste associated with a situation where you don't necessarily expect it? So. Now that's when I think we can actually branch more into like the automation aspect of mm-hmm. this. Like now that we're changing things, where they're getting away of that so-called human touch on things. You know, where we could technically get to the point where we can understand that we, if we are doing gene therapy for humans, we can figure out like what living creatures exactly have the genetic makeup that makes up everything of us. We can do that with food easily. Yes. So replication of food, creation of food in that way can be a thing we can find a way to constituent down to say mexican food is these parts meat these parts spice this part this and then you just start throwing this into like some machine and just creating Mm. just like machine created mexican food where does it come to the point like we're trying to think where is this well i I, confusion thing going i think i had made this point earlier but like you know i think as far as running a kitchen, even if you automate a lot of processes, you still need the chef or the creative aspects it, for it. But I do think that the machine could get rid of a lot of the tedious things. Like one of my bosses was telling me, I didn't know this till recently, that there's even a machine that fillets fish now. Like it'll cut the fillet off the bone and also pull out the little pin bones. But apparently it's automated that they know they can do it in a very precise manner. Which are the pin bones? So when you cut through something in the trout or salmon family, you slice – what it's, there's, it's a softer bone fish. So what you do is you just slice through, it actually cuts through what the ribs are, Mm -hmm. but then you pull out, the ribs are stuck in the fish and you just take tweezers and pull them out. But apparently there's a machine that can do that now. Whereas whereas most fish, bass, and the majority of them, they're uh, they're harder bones, so you have to cut around the rib cage. But but that's a little harder, that's more of a technique, whereas the salmon and trout, it's just stroke of the knife, but then you have to go through and make sure you don't leave those bones in, because if... You cook that, somebody's going to bite into a little bone. And they're pretty small. Uh, they're still hard. I mean, you don't want to bite into one, obviously. But, um, you know, I think they're easy to miss because they're all kind of embedded in the fish. And you got to go through and pull them out without mutilating it. So they take our job. They take our job. Not that they, you know, there's that South Park thing where it's like, they took our jobs. Yeah, I'm just saying why I say yeah. they take our jobs. It's like, they take our jobs. So maybe you can do it in, a vo- in like a robot voice. Like, they take our jobs. Or, or something. Yeah. Because some of these jobs with automation, they're being taken away. There's this, uh, who is it? Uh, Stefan Molino said this. We both listened to him. And yeah. this has been said in different places. It's even like an example with like the slavery times. People would say, okay, why do we have slaves? Like, if we free the slaves, who's going to pick the cotton? Yeah. And it's like, oh, no, there's going to be these machines that come across and just do all this. They're going to be harvested by yeah. liquid made from black gunk that's pulled out yeah. of the ground. And that black gunk <laughs> is actually the remnants of trees. And, so that's yeah. actually like really old solar energy. That's like the greenest form of solar energy. It's literally green solar energy that's gone into the ground. So it it's kind of this process where it's like, okay, automation is going to these needs are not going to go away so automation is kind of going to come in and take some of these things yes at the same point um there's this good manga i mentioned this manga before i'll definitely send it to you so you can check out sure but there's this one character that has this copy skill where he's like for example he's copying this master sushi chef who the, the way you cut the fish is very important right yes so this guy has practiced for years and years but this other guy has this copy technique where he can copy the exact way that person's doing it he even that that guy even gives him like his knife and says okay here like try to see if you can do it exactly but end up this is shogeki no soma I don't know if you guys I love manga but anyway there's uh-huh. um there's uh something in that where it's showing okay the copying of it yet at that point now you have the machines before you needed years or years or years or whatever to yeah. learn how to cut fish learn how to pick the fish learn how to pick the right ones the right cuts but now if you have machines automating these things the barrier for entry might be dropped. Now, will the chefs who are doing it be as skillful? And this is the same thing with information. As we were talking about before, the barrier to entry to writing a news article used to be a lot higher because you had to know how to type, you had to have access to the typewriter, you have to get to the place, you have to break down the information, you have to go through thesauruses and find out information. Now you just go on a blog and you just put it yeah. out there. 
or like me, you just <laughs> open a YouTube channel, yeah. record it on your phone, yeah. and <laughs> upload it. So, what 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 do you think's happening with the with the food industry when it comes to that? What's it doing to the food industry to this to the to the occupation of saying this is a chef, this is somebody who's capable at preparing food. How do you think it's affecting farmers? How do you think it's affecting people in the industry having this automation coming through? Well, I'm wondering, you know, I was talking to one of my bosses about this the other day, actually. We're wondering if it might kind of go the route of uh, car companies where a lot of these people are put out of work. And then you see it, well, that's happened in Detroit, and that's really sad because, of course, Detroit used to be the richest per capita city in the U.S. Like, you were middle class or you had it made. Mm -hmm. But then... Uh, it was a combination of buying Japanese cars, buying European cars, uh, but also a lot of the automation because, you, you know, it's like, are you going to have a machine that can just work around the clock? Are you going to hire a person who's going to want sick days, going to want vacations, going to want health benefits? It, uh, if, it, if, it if it's more cost effective to buy the machine, install it and let it run, you're going to do that over hiring people just for a period of time. And that's yeah. that gets into the whole debate about the minimum wage, too. Like, they've talked about... Uh, a lot of the, you know, a lot of things like the iPad or the kiosk, the self-checkout kiosk, replacing workers. Yeah. But the thing is, they'll only replace workers if it's more cost-effective to do so. But the thing is, if you jack up the minimum wage really high, it, it is cost-effective yeah, because it's cost like, am I going to pay someone twenty or more an hour when it's like I can? Yeah, if the, my initial upfront cost will be a lot, but once the machines are there, it's just going and that's it, and then it's just paying back. Yeah, so people have that stuck. They're stuck between okay, automation's meant to take away jobs, but then now you have automation, and then now you don't need people picking cotton in the fields. I yeah. mean, there was other reasons for slavery, but I mean that was this major reason saying we need work. So when it comes to that, people need to understand there's there's two ways to, to approach some of these topics where there's positives and negatives. Things happen, and I think if you have less regulation, if you have less um, overt control over certain things, then there's a slower transition. I'm trying to think of any field where it's not as regulated, where people are learning more. So it's not like all of a sudden this happens and then all of a sudden you're displaced. Like well, Yaron, Yaron Brook, uh, he's the head of the Ayn Rand Institute, for those that don't know. He made the example a while ago of, you think about when the light bulb was invented, about how Rockefeller dominated the oil industry, like 90% control, but then when the light bulb became big, well, people started using that instead of kerosene lamps, so that really hurt his business. Yeah. And he went from 90, I think it was down to like 62% or something. But you think about it, it's like today's world, they would have been like, okay, you have to have this, a lab this size, you have to have probably a degree to do this, you have to have all that. So, yeah, I mean, Edison, whoever did these kinds of things, they took risks, but at the same time, that was more important to him than, than okay, some law saying it has to be like this. And then also before the light bulb, before when the kerosene lamp came in, it was whale oil. People were complaining that because it was whale oil. Like this entire society is a major part of both European and uh, I don't know if this is part of the reason why the Japanese societies were as they are, but I think they also just really like fish. <laughs> I'm gonna try and taste whale. No, ah, oh, damn it, Greenpeace is on me. But anyway, <laughs> go to Masa. But, they have raised whale tongue. Oh, yeah. cool. I'm gonna track. Okay, the, the, but out. the tasting is like six hundred dollars or oh, something. No, okay, yeah. So maybe I won't. <laughs> but <laughs> so they had these entire societies on that, and then. Kerosene came about, it put a lot of people out of work, but the, sl the whales were also going close to being extinct. Yeah. Now, that's another question, whether I think animals should or should not be eaten, where they're saying, oh, they were doing this, so the whales were dying off because people were hunting them for kerosene, but then... Now kerosene you're became... About, not well, kerosene, I mean... Whale, whale, oil, oil. whale oil became expensive because yeah. there's fewer whales, there's going to be less oil, and then yes. the price that goes That would have up, happened yeah. anyway, but yeah. then now you look at other animals which were eating like things like cows and chickens... And they're doing better than any other animal because it's in our in somebody's interest to make them reproduce as much as yeah. possible, yeah. which they are issues again. Just back to the whole thing: information comes in. That's a whole topic. The things in itself, happen, yeah. and then how it happens. The ideas from back at positive, negative. That's something that you see after it's occurred. Sure. So where are we going next now with this? So we've touched on the automation. We've touched on the growth. We've touched on the oh yeah, yeah, how would it affect farmers and so on. Um, I think, I mean, already we, we've seen, this isn't recent, but of course we went from more small town farms to more factory farming. Yeah. And I think that has a lot to do with regulations as well. Uh, I'd have to look, I have to look more into this, but I know it has to do with, for example, I have some friends upstate who sell raw milk, but they can only do it on a very small level. Yes. They can't, they can't ship stuff all over and they would love to, but the government says, no, you can't do this. And there was a certain state, I remember somebody got arrested for selling raw milk and 
the rule I think with them is like you can sell it, but it has to be on a very small level, and it's like pretty locally, like friends and neighbors and so on. But the thing is, I went up there, I saw the whole process. It's very well done. I mean, they have the cows, of course, they line them up. They have these like sterile, clean containers. They drop. I forget the temperature, but the danger zone that's where bacteria grows. It's about mm -hmm. forty to one forty. Um, it's it's below that. The metal containers are below that in temperature. So the milk, the cows are milked. It goes into these containers, cooled down, and it goes into bottles. That's it. And that's a misconception that a lot of people have is people think, oh, raw milk, you get sick. But because they eat milk, they, sorry, they drank milk that where the cow was milked, it sat in a bucket for like yeah. a day or something. It has all that bacteria you drink. Yeah, you get sick off that. But if it's cooled down right away, that's it. Yeah. And yeah. then uh, it's much better for you. I know that it has healthy bacteria. It has a natural probiotics uh, in it. I know that... Um, there was a story actually where they took salmonella, that's a foodborne illness, and they put it in a sample of raw milk, and the uh, the healthy bacteria actually destroyed the salmonella, uh -huh. which was pretty cool. I know people who are lactose intolerant can have raw milk because there's lactase, which is the enzyme, yeah. but the enzyme gets destroyed by heat. It's kind so of like that, a cheese thing. Yeah, so that that's why. But again, it just it comes down to the way it was handled. Like, you know, I mean, when I, when I was younger, I was taught, you know, don't eat raw fish, don't eat raw meat, you'll get sick. But no, again, it's a question of how it's yeah. handled. If you know, you have these old these old school meat houses. You have people working with no gloves. The meat's sitting out, flies buzzing. Yeah, of course, people get sick off that. But, I mean, if everything's handled carefully. And my old job, I used to make beef tartare. And with that, it's like you actually break down the meat. You run it through the grinder yourself and so on. And it's like, okay, you're not going to get sick off that because it's handled correctly. Yeah. And this is kind of a weird thing. It's The thing with milk, just on the side one, um, it was the time I just stopped drinking milk. I mean, occasionally I'll get, like... Uh, I'll take months off and then get back on it. But I was just thinking, like, milk is for baby cows. Yeah. At least cow milk is for baby cows. And there was this place in New York City that was actually making... Uh, New York City, an odd place. <laughs> it was this place that was making ice cream with human breast milk, which is kind of weird. Yeah. No, sorry. There's something on the screen. But, yeah, there was they were making human ice cream. Yeah, I saw in, that yeah, advertised. So it's like, human oh. ice cream, which is an odd thing. So, And another thing with milk... It's something. There's something about it that makes people bloat and stuff like that. So it's it's an odd thing, but it's a give or take type thing. Like, what is the purpose of milk? What is the uses of it? And then there's so many like, milk even substitutes. Start consuming things, it, yeah. yeah, like there's milk substitutes which are mostly juice because soy. What was it? There was uh, adult language. There was this thing. Someone was like, it should be called soy juice because there's no soy tit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it kind of makes sense. Yeah. So with some of these things, you well, kind of almond milk, milk, that. Hemp yeah. milk, all that. Yeah. It's also suspicious. How do they get these things out of it? Like, how do they get oil out of corn? You know, that's a kind of weird process. And some of these things, I'm like, ah, I'm very, very sus sus suspicious of this food thing I'm putting in my body. <laughs> Yeah, but okay. So we we're talking about the automation. We we're talking about the changes. How it affects farmers as well. About, as... Um, yeah, how it affects farmers, and we also were talking about how dishes come. You were talking about this French thing where it was just somebody kind of making a mistake, and then or just playing around, or not playing around, but um, what was it? what's actual? How would you? What would you well, I mean, I guess with the doing? potato chip, you could say they got it wrong <laughs> essentially. Yeah. And but the so, same thing with the tarte town. Yeah. Like, oh, I meant to have the, the fruit sit in the pot and just cook a little, but instead it started to caramelize, but it's like, wait, what can I do with it now? Okay, let me bake it with the crust on, and then it's, oh, now I have a new dish. Because yeah. they start that new dish, it starts in somebody's home, and then they tell their, their kids, and then their kids tell people, it becomes a family thing, then becomes a clan thing, becomes, they open maybe a restaurant in that small town, enough people come by, then some rich person or some wealthy person hears about it, maybe the local lord is like, oh, this is cool, the next time he has some ambassador coming from another country, that person gets invited in. That person comes in, makes this dish. That ambassador's like, wow, I had this dish when I was in France. And then now everybody who comes to France asks for this dish or it comes to that yeah. place. It becomes part of that cuisine. Then it becomes in the world. And then now it becomes part of French cuisine. So that long thing I'm yeah. just talking about how it comes from somebody's kitchen going out there. So that somebody's mother, somebody's father does something and it becomes ma pa food and then it goes into like ma pa of everybody in this country's food. Yeah. So now you also see a similar thing where somebody's like the ma pa restaurants type of things and ma pa stores with their artisanal food, which just starts that way. But then you get to the point where there's more automation, where now you can have machines doing these processes that used to need hands sometimes little ch children hands with a child labor thing yeah <laughs> that kind of thing you used to have this kind of dexterity so it would grow from that and then 
slowly by slowly it grows to a big point where there's enough like we're talking about the pro the price points where it becomes worth hiring enough people to do certain parts of it and then you're automating parts but with human machines in that way and now you're also automating things with um with actual well, I was gonna machine th machines. I was going to think of a story too. My grandfather told me. Uh, I forget what year if this when this was. If this was like seventies, eighties, or something. Mm -hmm. But uh, he lived in. He, he and my my mom lived in New Orleans for a time. They lived down there. That was his job for Air Products. Air Products. For those that don't know, it's still around. It's a big company. They sell. You can probably tell by the name air air related things: helium, hydrogen, nitrogen, etc. Anyway, he was selling a nitrogen to this uh, guy who actually was like a shrimp uh, purveyor basically and he was saying how he had all these women working with him who had to clean into vein shrimp you know pull the shell off and cut the vein out inside but he was saying that when the minimum wage was jacked up even at that time he actually instead got a machine that was able to do it which made sense because those women were paid you know back in those days probably like a few bucks an hour but the point is it was more cost effective for him to get that machine that just has a blade it puts him on a I'm not sure 100%, but I think it's like on a conveyor belt, there's like a blade it runs through, then it washes it out, and then it's yeah. like, there, you just have that whole system streamlined. But because that minimum wage was higher, it wasn't worth paying all those women to do that anymore, and then it was worth investing in that machine. Yeah. And one other point I was going to add on that, I think that's one that's another issue they always talk about, like mom and pop stores disappearing versus big companies to getting bigger and bigger. And I think part of that is a lot of those big companies, they can afford that capital investment of mm -hmm. the big machine. Whereas you're just opening a small restaurant, it's like, you know, you can't afford that machine, but at the same time, it's like, can you keep paying staff to do yeah. the work? Are they willing to do it? And then if they leave, you gotta get new people. And then there's other series of problems. Because also with saying like the Ma Pa shop, like what if your mother and father happen to be called Walton? Like, <laughs> yeah. like yeah. even when it comes down to it, something like Walmart is still a Ma Pa shop. It's this very wealthy mothers and fathers. <laughs> well, I, I, I wrote, I, I don't know if I mentioned him in a previous video, but I wrote a report about Dave Thomas, the Wendy's founder. I wrote this when I was in ninth grade or so. And, uh, he was actually, he worked under Colonel Sanders. Sanders was actually his mentor, but he went off, uh, he said, Thomas went off on his own and then he opened up Wendy's. It was actually, his daughter's name wasn't actually Wendy, but I guess she looked like the character from Peter Pan. That's where the nickname came from. And, uh, you know, he had one or two small places, but then that expanded. And of course, by the time of his death, it was, you know, definitely across the nation and probably across the world too. But, you know, that again started off as kind of a small town place. I mean, Sanders too, his place, I think it was called like the Hobby House or something, yeah. and then it became Kentucky Fried Chicken, and then that expanded and so on. So those guys started off small too. I mean, Sanders, I think, founded KFC off of like a social security check or something. He was an older man when he started it, but it ended up doing really well. And you see that all over the place. People go places to consume information, to, con to get food, to get nourishment, and then things do happen. I mean, we're not saying this doesn't happen, but there, some things get displaced and some things get replaced with better things. Yeah. And some things might get replaced with some more negative things, but I think when it comes down to it, we, we were having this conversation earlier about how how some things that seem really horrible go on. You know, you look at some people and you're like, why are you eating that food? Yeah. You know, and it's like, okay, that food might be like only 1% nutritious, but as long as it's not poisonous outright, yeah. somebody will still eat it. Because yeah. like, there's still something in that culture that will still pass it on. And I think you see this in information as well. You see this in certain tactics, certain practices that make things tougher and tougher. But I think there's a constant process of kind of refining these kind of things. And then it gets to that point where it's like, yes, the fusion or the confusion. When it comes to a point where, can you fuse these new ideas into this original dish and still maintain what that dish was, maintain the nutrition aspect of that dish? Or does it get to a point where you've, by adding this much, you've got to a point where there's so much confusion where it's no longer that thing anymore? So I think that's it's a, it's a key thing to kind of see what's happening with these changes. Well, it, it kind of goes back to the uh, Aristotelian concept of what is an essence, that, like how do you define something based on its essence? And yeah, Molyneux, again, he, uh, he said that he had a professor in school used this example of like, you, ha you have a baby, okay, it's a baby, and the baby turns blue. Oh, now I have a blue baby. Now the baby has tentacles. Oh, it's a blue baby with tentacles. Mm -hmm. You just keep adding things on and on. And then at yeah. some point you're like, okay, this isn't a baby anymore. Yeah. But the question is, where is that distinguishing point where it becomes, this is something else. This isn't what it originally was. And I, th and I think that's what a lot of it is. Like you can say, okay, sushi, you know, certain types of fish, soy sauce, rice cooked with rice vinegar, sugar, uh, a little bit of salt maybe. Um, 
you know, uh, gin, the candy, ginger, and so on. And it's like, that's pretty typical of Japanese. Yeah. But then if you were to start adding some of the Mexican spices or something, it'd be like, okay, now this is something else. And like, is this Japanese? Well, not authentically. Is it something else? Yeah. Is it good? Okay, well, let's decide. I mean, yeah. You know. And that's, uh, that's also goes yeah. with the political aspect where both people right now, uh, pers- <laughs> this might be being watched later, but this is in 2017, uh, September. There's still a lot, a lot of very heated times with the presidential election. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Hillary Clinton just said she's open to contesting the the actual vote. And there's a whole mess with people saying, people on the Democratic Party saying Hillary Clinton needs to go away. People on the Republican side saying, no, she needs to stay there because she's making people see yeah. how crazy they are. And then the Republicans are also like, oh, Donald Trump isn't representing the Republicans. Like... They're wondering why the Republican Party people are not supporting him. There's the establishment yeah. Republicans, they call them that. They want to do. They want to keep catering to their special interests, but yeah. of course, you know he's trying to fight against. At least you know that was one of the main reasons he was running. So, and I think that's there's two situations there where people lead into this confusion. Is people haven't realized that these parties have fused together. Yeah. There's no longer a Democratic Party in that anybody had a sense of. No. Neither is a Republican Party. So people are it's leading to a lot of confusion of people saying, why isn't my party behaving this way? Or why is she acting that insane? Or why is he this boisterous about these things? Why aren't they supporting him? Because well, it's one party. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a unit party. It's a uni well, the party point, the point, point. Uh, you know, I think to discuss this a little bit before, but I've said it a lot too. Like, you think about it, you know, the Republicans always talk about balancing the budget and so on. I mean, they haven't ran a balanced budget since Eisenhower. And I think... Coolidge was the last Republican president to run a surplus and actually pay down the debt, and that was 1920s. Yeah. And then I, I, what I criticize the Democrats for is it's a thing with war, how, you know, when Bush was going in Iraq and stuff, they're all yelling against that. But then when Obama's ordering all these drone strikes across the Middle East, silence. And then Trump comes in, oh, no, he's going to get us into a war. And it's like, wait a minute, you supported Hillary. She voted for all the spending. She voted for the Iraq war. She said taking out Assad is a priority, but there was no mm-hmm. criticism of that. And then it becomes... Well, do you believe in the principle, or are you just going with what your party wants? And that can be applied to both sides, of course. But there's there's that where it's like I see that on both sides, and I ask, do you add, are these the principles you believe in? And this could be tied to food too. You know, is this is this what this what makes up what you believe? This is important to you, and you're going to support it. Here's why, or is it just well, this side is doing it, and I have to go along with it because I want to fit in with the crowd. Yeah. yeah. It's strange, yeah, it's strange how much these food things tie into people. People yeah. say, oh, this culture is okay. Like, oh, think about all the foods. I, that's such a, I keep just hearing people say that. It's like, that's such a dumb argument to bring up. And people are like, oh, it's a, it's a melting pot. It's so good. Oh, we get Greek food. We get this food. I'm just like, ah. Oh. But at the same point, that's why we're having this conversation. Yeah. Because we're talking about how key food is. How yeah. key that preparation is. How key what you ingest is. And it, it, is, it is a part of it. And... A society that happens to have a lot of food in its in its cuisine will likely be a society that's not in a desert, and yeah. then when it's not in a desert, that's going to develop certain uh, appreciations, certain myths, or certain practices of how they deal with each other. You know, you're going to have a situ- situation. You're probably not going to have too many like, let's say it's in your history. You're not going to have too many myths of floods beginning let's say it goes back to thing and then that yeah. can develop how people's religions so there's just very many interesting kind of connections and realizations yeah, there, there was a scene behind moby dick about you know trying to overcome nature ambition accomplishing that huge goal and of course back then i mean it's not it's not really food it was for the whale oil mm-hmm. but it was it was the same concept of okay that plays into the theme behind that and uh you know, is of course the whole thing about sacrificing to get a bountiful harvest and all that. Where does you know where does that come from? And so I, th- I think I think some of that carries across though, because I mean, yeah. of course you have the Aztecs; they're famous for the human sacrifices. But then you also had the Romans who sacrificed animals for feasts or other things too. So I mean, I don't know. Maybe Jordan Peterson, uh, the psychologist, maybe he's written some stuff on this. I don't know, but that's sort of a common trend I noticed too. I almost wonder where does that come from. Talking about the whales, one thing that'd be cool to do is to see. If there's any possible, do you guys know if there's any source? If you guys are listening to this, I'll probably try to look. But if you guys know of one, you can leave it in the comment section. If there's any cost-effective way of farming something like whales, like you know, like I was thinking, like okay, let's say it was actually for food, like actually the meat too, would there be a cost-effective way of farming them? I, I, I don't know if they could be because I think even you already get to the point where so few people are farming things like cows because it's an exorbitant cost. It's not cheap to have animals and feed them and do that 
it's these very small margins these things are well I, I learned too when I was doing yes. the seafood sales like scallops a lot of people don't like to farm raise those because apparently they take a while to grow so the thing is too it's like you figure you have to plant them you have to wait for them to grow but at the same time different things can happen and of course if it's out at sea if you know there's pollution or there's some tide or there's something okay there goes your investment and then it's a lot of people aren't willing to spend that money because the risk is too high for the payoff to be worth it that's what it was yeah. in that particular case but then something like mussels um they run them they grow them along these ropes that just run into the water they pull out the rope there's a ton of them clinging to one uh those are i mean those prince edward island mussels are like a dollar something a pound like super cheap mm -hmm. uh but then abalone for those that don't know it's this uh shellfish that has a very shiny like kind of rainbow shell that used to be very expensive too but then they started farming those as well and uh you know, you can get those cheaper now. I mean, I think they're, they're still pricier compared to the PEI mussels or something, but compared to what they used to be where you had to actually go down and dive and find them with oysters and other things. So, How do these... Is, like, I, I'm sure I've seen this in some Discovery Channel thing some time back, but is growing the shells part of the process of the animal? Is there a way to do like a reusable shell so you can just grow the interior thing into like a shell that's like farmed or it's like some kind of ceramic shell that you don't need to wait for the creature to keep creating its new shell i would have to look that up that's yeah. actually an interesting case because i know there's what is it the hermit crab where it loses it, it gets rid of its shell and finds another one yeah. and so on but i don't know about hmm. yeah i don't know about that that's actually that's a good question <laughs> yeah okay so i think we're gonna wind that down here but um any other topics we're talking about the automation we talked about the mapa stores technology We'll try to break out on this more in the next video. I think we'd like to go more into like the drinking and the cultural aspects around alcohol and that's a good one. Alcohol and intoxicants in general, because I just saw this really odd video of um, because I tried to I'll see if I can link it. I'm gonna say link it and then don't link these things. But uh, there was this video from Vice, which is this news channel thing where they had these people hanging in some mountains in Honduras and getting these these um getting some honey from this hanging beehive and then apparently there's some hallucinogenic process into it and then somebody was commenting in the section it was like i'm from honduras and you guys are here trying to get high on this thing when it's actually just something we normally use at a basic level but even the hondurans who were poking they were destroying this hive as they were doing this yeah we're getting high so there's this process of there's been a part of intoxication and beat alcohol, beat other forms of plants and other things where some things are legal to be ingested in certain ways, some things aren't, and how it shapes the cultures and how the societies treat and deal with these things. So I think. Well, I was going to say, I wanted to actually answer your earlier question. You were talking about how was beer invented. It was uh, Sumeria, which goes before the Egyptians. Mm -hmm. And I have to look up the guy's name, but the story I heard was that he tried to make basically a granola bar but he added too much water to it and then it fermented and that's because a lot of because if you make bread in the typical way with yeast and so on it's almost exactly like beer you just figure there's more flour and because of that that's how it gets that consistency yeah. whereas with beer you strain it off and of course there, you know there are hops and other things too uh we can get more into this in another discussion yeah. but uh but the fact the overall framework is the same as far as yeast feeding on sugar that creates alcohol and you know, and, the, and it was basically again by accident, but it was like that became beer, and then, or I guess maybe not beer itself, sort of the precursor of it. Then a lot of European monks and the Germans started tweaking it later. You mm -hmm. had lager, wheat beer, and all that. Uh, I'm a big fan of this beer. It's called Weihen Stefaner. It's uh, the oldest beer in the world. I think it's, it was founded something like 1040 AD. It's like I don't think it's gonna be cool. 2040, they celebrate their thousandth year. Yeah, you know? mm -hmm. it's yeah. really cool. Yeah, you know, but of course, being American, I mean, the country hasn't even been around that long, so it's cool to know that business has just survived this entire time. Nice. Yeah, yeah and then also in the bees thing, we might talk about this in the next one. Sure. But since we're here on automation, people are like, yeah, like three out of four or something like that. Some high number of all the food you eat has been has some ingredients that were pollinated by bees and we get that yes i get that but if bees kind of went away i'm sure there's going to be some form of like automated pollination of plants and goods and things like that and we might already have replicators by that time so that might not be an issue but yeah so <laughs> that's it for me this is silas as i said steven thanks for listening uh guys uh, thanks for listening to the series if you haven't checked out the other episodes check them out i think there's good information there really and i was going to say too if you feel free to answer anything anything that we left out we weren't sure yeah. about feel free to comment if you have any sources on the subjects that you want to share please do yeah I mean, or we'll, suggestions for topics that yeah you might definitely always like hearing that sure 
I think you might actually get to more research. Yeah. I mean, for these things, we kind of just talk about the yeah, topic at hand, hand, yeah. hand, yeah. hand, and then we just kind of sit down and have a conversation. So, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed it. We, I mean, I did. I did too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Until next time, goodbye. See you soon. Bye bye. <laughs>